Hello everyone, it's the 18th of November, which means it's time to review... Kablam! So Kablam! is obviously an allegorical Doctor Who story. Kablam! is an allegory for Amazon. And one criticism that people made last year is that it didn't go far enough in criticising Amazon's practices. The other thing the story allegorises is automation replacing jobs. And in this case, the human workforce have to be mandated back in to being able to work. Two weeks ago, reviewing the Saranga Conundrum, I said there were moments of Jennifer Perrett's direction that I didn't really like and I hope she did better in Kablam. She certainly did. This episode is really well directed. Even the conveyor belt sequence, which last year I thought looked pretty crummy. You know what? I think that's just ABC iView's <laughs> compression method. Because on the Blu-ray, it looks pretty good. You know, it looks like a special effect. But it looks like a really good special effect. And the performances from Tosin and Mandip really sell it. As well as the direction, I love the design of this story. I love that the production team have gone with the sort of retro futurism that we got a lot in the Russell T Davies era. Simple conveyor belts and those sort of plastic flaps to keep the air conditioning in. Very normal, recognisable things, but with a futuristic edge. This is a story about shorthand. It wants to give us recognisable elements that we can latch onto and immediately understand what they are. As a result, Judy doesn't have a hologram in front of her where she's typing everything in. She's got a clipboard. Slade doesn't just have a computer, he has a filing cabinet. Although that is lampshaded at the end when Slade said he knew there was something wrong with the system, but if it was the system at fault, he couldn't risk storing a digital copy of anything, he had to go analogue. And that's just a very clever little detail. And also a comment on the role of automation in our lives as well. When we think about data leaks, if you have something written down on paper in your own handwriting, no one can get a hold of that remotely. They have to get a hold of it physically. Probably the most direct story to compare this to in the classic series is The Robots of Death, where humanity is reliant on robots, and if they suddenly turned on humanity, then that would mean the end of that civilization, is what the Doctor says. If we take it as read that there are 10,000 humans, and this place mandates 10% human employment, that means there's 90,000 robots working for Kablam shipping things all over the galaxy. When Kablam goes down for a month, mind you, at the end of this story, that is going to be felt. And just like the Robots of Death, the Doctor doesn't stick around to see how that works out. The big difference here is that the teammates, the Kablam men, as I think some people have christened them, they're not given individual personalities in a way that some of the robots were in Robots of Death. They're controlled from the system, from a central core, and the system can put all its resources into one robot, or share it around everyone else. Now, as such, I find it very interesting that the head of people is the one who tears the head off a robot to stop it attacking Charlie. It shows that the humans see the robots as disposable people, but the robots have supplanted the humans. It's sort of a chicken and egg situation. The humans can exert control over the robots, but the robots control humans' lives. But the robots have only taken over because the humans built them. The system which runs Kablam has some degree of sentience and autonomy, but it isn't attempting to take over humanity. It's attempting to save people. It brings home the idea that if anything bad happens to humanity because of automation, it is our own fault. We've built these robots, and I don't mean that in a maximum overdrive kind of way, but it's also not really in a Terminator or Matrix kind of way. The robots haven't turned on us because we're unworthy. They're just doing what they're told. Something the story doesn't really interrogate or discuss, but just raises, is... If you have a society where all the work can be done by robots, why is it still a capitalist society? Why can't it be like Star Trek, you know, fully automated space communism? And I kind of would have liked 
one of the characters to comment on that. You know, one of our TARDIS team. Especially the companions who are from the 21st century and they've been to the future a couple of times now and they might be interested in asking, well, hold on, why do we still have the same problems? Why is it necessary for people to work when life sounds like it could be pretty idyllic and you could let the robots run everything? I suppose when you're setting up an allegorical world, we need shortcuts to get into that we need to understand, okay, well, the shape of this world is that you have this mega corporation which is exploiting its workers and they're also ending up dead. If you pay too much attention to how this world might actually work and the interior machinations of it, it may not stand up to scrutiny. But that's because the story is trying to deliver a message. But the message of Kablam gets a little bit garbled, in my opinion. And that's because this pesky thing called an adventure has to get in the way. You know, we have to have a plot and we have to have a mystery to investigate. I love the idea that the Doctor and her friends immediately get in undercover. And they use the psychic paper and it's used exactly for the reason that Russell T Davies invented it. It's to get the Doctor into the plot. It doesn't matter how the Doctor gets hired in the factory. We don't need a 25-minute episode of her faking credentials. It's just, boom, we're in. Interestingly, visually, when they are being sort of screened to go into the factory, when that blackout hits, Yaz is separated from the rest of the group. You've got the Doctor, Graham and Ryan on one side, and you've got Yaz on the other side. And it's kind of a metaphor for the character relationships in a way because I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago why I think we have the impression that Yaz is underused and it's because the Doctor, Graham and Ryan are all linked by Grace's death and also her life in the case of the two companions as well. Whereas Yaz knew her, she only knew her as a child and she's come back into Ryan and Grace's lives right at the end of Grace's life. So that immediately sets her apart from the others. And I can't help but feel that this would have been mitigated by Yaz just having stayed friends with Ryan through their teenage years. And it wouldn't have detracted anything from the characters. They feel like they've known each other for ages anyway. There's no kind of awkwardness between them aside from that little crush conversation in Rosa. So I don't know why that didn't happen. That's why I think Yaz is kind of set apart from everyone. And here, she's set apart from everyone. She's sent down to Dispatch to work with Dan Cooper, played by Lee Mack. The Doctor and Ryan are together. Initially, it was meant to be Ryan and Graham together, but the Doctor swaps things around, and Graham is sent off by himself too. So we have the traditional Doctor Who thing of everyone splitting up. It's really well done, and I love the Doctor's disappointment about not being allowed to ride the conveyor belt. <laughs> and how she looks at her friends for support, as if they were really thinking about doing it. <laughs> I love Jodie's childlike enthusiasm in the role, and finding out that she can't do the exact thing a ten-year-old would want to do in this situation, and being really disappointed like that. Not sinking into a sulk, or having a tantrum, you know, still accepting it, but just being <laughs> appalled and baffled that she's not allowed to do the fun thing. Lee Mack as Dan Cooper, it's a really great turn, and Doctor Who in the new series has had real success with casting companions. Of course, Catherine Tate, but also Frank Skinner as Perkins back in Mummy on the Orient Express. And I love the idea of casting Lee Mack as someone who tells bad jokes as a way to get through the day. It makes him a really sweet character, and also it comes to something that he is someone who attempts to engage the teammates, the robots, in sort of friendly human banter. He sees them as his co-workers, he knows they can't respond, but I get the impression from him that he is just longing for the day when one of them comes back with a witty retort. I think that would totally make his year. I love that both he and Kira, they're doing this for their families. And it's, it's kind of tragic, but it's kind of sweet as well. Family is one of the big themes of this year of Doctor Who. And we've got the family that the Doctor has created for herself. We've got Ryan and Graham bonded by the fact that they are family, even if Ryan's uncomfortable with that. 
And we've met Yaz's family a couple of times now as well. And the fact that both the Doctor and Yaz really appreciate Lee and Kira's desire to do things for their family, either to help their family or to honour their family, it's really sweet. I love how the Doctor reacts to Kira's outlook on life. Kira's unabashed enthusiasm is a very exaggerated trait, but Claudia Jesse actually manages to underplay it a bit, and I think that's why she doesn't become insufferable and why I really like her. I think most people who watch the episode and enjoy the episode really like her as well. And it's done so when she is killed. It has an effect on us as the viewer. It is another example of a loved one being killed to motivate another character. A lot of people die in Doctor Who, but this series really seems to have a fetish for killing off significant others at a rate of knots, you know. It's, it's a little bit disturbing. I get the reason for it. And it makes the system even more uncomfortable, because of course the system kills Kira. To make it clear to Charlie, who, spoiler alert, although I don't know why you'd be watching this review without watching the episode, Charlie's the villain, the system kills Kira to make Charlie realise the consequences of his actions, not in a retributive way, but this is what you're going to do to thousands of people. You are going to rob them of their loved ones, and this is how it feels. And, you know, I'm a little uncomfortable with it. Because the system takes a life. But Charlie has taken, I think, seven lives to date, so where's the right and where's the wrong? Again, we don't get enough criticism from the Doctor from that, just like, I don't feel that she criticised Jack Robertson enough, she doesn't get to deal with Crasco, she doesn't get to deal with the mob from last week, the Patings obeying instinct. It makes it a little murky. As does the Doctor basically supporting the system against Charlie. But the Doctor does say that, in her view, Charlie is not an activist. You know, an activist, of course, wants to change things. But most activists don't use violent methods for their means. We've had a story this season about the civil rights movement in America, which was predicated on non-aggressive, non-violent resistance. Charlie, of course, is trying to bring the system down because there aren't enough people employed at Kablam and robots have taken over everything. So the Amazon allegory falls a bit apart there because in a way, if people are being exploited by Kablam, Charlie actually wants more people to be exploited? He's trying to send out the Kablam men with the deadly bubble wrap, love the Doctor Who element of taking something innocuous and harmless and turning it into something dangerous. That is absolutely brilliant. And even if the recipient doesn't pop it, someday someone is going to pop that bubble wrap and they're going to go, Pfft. it's very interesting that initially the doctor is sent to maintenance because the system knows that it's Charlie doing this, but can't seem to stop him directly. The system does send a teammate after him at one point. I did wonder about that. Why didn't it do that earlier? And really, I think the computer is getting increasingly desperate. It knows that Charlie is very close to fulfilling its plan, so it tries to kill Charlie. And when it can't kill Charlie, it kills Kira to try to prove to Charlie why he shouldn't do what he does. And you know what? It's uncomfortable. It's definitely uncomfortable, but I think now it is deliberately uncomfortable. And then we get the ending, where the Doctor defends the system against Charlie. The thing is, the Doctor makes it clear that she sympathises with how Charlie feels. She only objects to his methods. And if you look back through Doctor Who, there's plenty of examples of this. The one that springs to mind is Invasion of the Dinosaurs, where the villains want to erase the pollution of the planet and the extinction of species. Now it's going to erase billions of people. And the Doctor says he sympathises, but he can't allow them to do this. And really, that's the choice the Doctor faces here. Does she side with the corporation and save thousands upon thousands of people? Or does she side with the revolutionary, activist, terrorist, whatever Charlie wants to call himself, and allow the company to fall at the cost of all those lives? 
I mean, this is the Doctor. What do you think any other Doctor would have done in this situation? I think they would have done exactly what the 13th Doctor does here. But something I noticed on this rewatch is that the Doctor's solution is to make the Kablam men deliver to themselves. Because the Kablam men have to deliver. However, she then instructs them to open the boxes and pop the bubble wrap. And she didn't need to do that. Because if the Kablam men deliver their packages, all they have to do is not open the packages, find a way to dispose of them, drop them into the sun, and Kablam can continue operating as it had before. However, through the Doctor's actions, Kablam is put out of action for a month. All staff are given two weeks paid leave. Should really be four weeks paid leave, but I think that's a final bit of commentary on corporate culture. And as a result, Judy is now going to push for Kablam to be a 100% people company. Now, if there's not a machine running things, I think the hope is it will get better. I think the Doctor has done something very clever with this ending. Because remember, she even tries to save Charlie. It's not a matter of she wants to blow Charlie up, but she has to save as many people as possible. And that's what she does. But through her actions, hopefully Kablam will change and improve. So this isn't the Doctor's morality from the Sunmakers, where the Doctor inspires a whole revolution and Gatherer Hay gets thrown off a roof, etc, etc. This is more like the Doctor of Invasion of the Dinosaurs and the Robots of Death. She will solve the immediate problem, but sorting out the society has to be down to the people within that society. Despite Slade's abrasiveness and Judy's sort of flustered nature, they do both seem to care about the people in their employ. They are both appalled by the deaths and disappearances that have happened. And we're left kind of hopeful at the end that this society can change. That's not to say I don't enjoy stories where the Doctor sweeps in and changes an entire society, but I think in a series where we have just had a story where there was a massacre due to colonialism, that if we do have the Doctor sweeping in and saying, I'm going to fix all of this, it robs humanity of a chance to improve itself. And I think, in the end, the message of Kablam is, if a system is screwed up, you've got to change the system. The Doctor works outside the system. The Doctor destroys the system and preserves the people. Whereas Charlie's way would have destroyed the system and killed thousands of people. Is it a comfortable ending? No. Does the Doctor leave a bad situation still bad? Yeah, but there is a hope at the end of this story. And the other thing this season keeps saying it is about is hope. And I think this story lives up to that. I give Kablam 9 out of 10. It is really a very, very good story. I think it could have done perhaps with a little bit more polish, making some of its ideas a little bit clearer. But I also think the questionable morality of it is decently explored. It's explored in such a way that it makes itself pretty clear, but also inviting the audience to draw their own opinions. And something I found really fascinating about it is, in the weeks after this, I remember last year, you had people arguing that it was both pro and anti Amazon. And I think any allegorical story will result in that. It will result in people on both sides saying it supports their side. So, I suppose that's the sign of a good episode. Of course, this week we are back with Say Something Nice. That'll be around tomorrow, so I do hope you come back for that. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow.